Hey everyone, George Christie here with Wine Industry Network. Welcome to our inaugural packaging conference called Pack Explore, the intersection of design, innovation, engagement, and sustainability in wine packaging. Now, we always talk about packaging in, in some form at our in-person conferences, but um, we, we never had a full day dedicated to it. It was something that we felt strongly about. There's a lot happening in the packaging world, and we felt like it was time to dedicate a full day to this. So this first year, we're going to do it virtually. I fully expect that this is going to be an in-person event next year, but we want to get it started. So thank you for being with us today. We've got three great topics. We're going to be looking at how alternative packaging is doing in the marketplace. We've got a session dedicated to sustainability and packaging practices. And the final session of the day is we're going to be looking at how technology is being integrated into packaging to drive more engagement. Before we begin, as is always the case, it's very important to us that we have as much interaction as possible, as much engagement as possible between our audience and our speakers. And so to that effort, we always pre-record these sessions a few days earlier, and we do that for quality purposes, but mainly we do that so that while our speakers are presenting, you can be asking questions via the chat feature. So please take advantage of that, get those questions in, all of our speakers will be watching the broadcast live just like you are and taking those questions in, freaking taking those questions on as they come in. So please take advantage of that. Before we begin, I just want to say thank you to all of our sponsors. We could not do without your support. And in particular, I want to thank Astra Pouch, who is the session sponsor for today's opening session, Alternative Packaging by the Numbers. Now to kick things off, we're going to take a look at how these alternative packages are, and packaging is doing in the marketplace. And we've got two great presenters. We're going to start off with Christian Miller. Christian Miller is the research director for Wine Market Council and also the proprietor for Full Glass Research. Christian is going to be joined by Mike Provence. Mike is the CEO of 3x3 Insights. And between the two of them, they're going to talk a little bit about how the packaging has been received by the consumer how it's performing in the marketplace. And I think it's something that you're gonna find very interesting. So to kick things off, we're gonna begin with Christian and I'm gonna hand it off to him right now and uh, let him take it from here. This session is sponsored by Astro Pouch. Budget-friendly, fridge-friendly, earth-friendly. Thanks, George. It's good to be back. Uh, welcome to my little slice of Wynn's Pack Explore. Packaging is one of my greatest interests, and at Full Glass Research as proprietor, I've done a lot of package tests. Uh, but I'll be speaking today as in my role as research director for the Wine Market Council, where we've been tracking and probing package trends over the years. So this presentation is going to be a hodgepodge of some past research and observations based on my experience as well as the data. It isn't intended to be a comprehensive survey of sales or usage by all the various package types. What I hope to do is give you insight into what is behind some of the newer alternative packages. Now, some of this research will date back to 2019, and you might think that with all the wrenching changes of the last two years that it's not very relevant. But actually, most product-related trends of the past two years have stayed intact and so did so through the pandemic. How people shopped changed enormously, but what they were buying, not so much. So things that were hot before the pandemic continued that way through. Things that were not also lagged during the pandemic by and large. Most of this research comes from the Wine Market Council. The Wine Market Council is a nonprofit organization financed by its members, which include growers, wineries, importers, distributors, retailers, supplier industries, and regional organizations. Its mission is to do comprehensive consumer research with two objectives. One is to track consumption of beverage alcohol categories with an emphasis on wine over time, and the other is to do more in-depth individual market research projects on specific consumer trends or issues. For example, over the past two years, we've done research on pandemic-related purchasing habits, the intersection of health and wellness perceptions and various alcohol categories, and what types of information consumers deem most important when purchasing wine. We regularly release top-level findings and member of uh, topic findings, and members receive the complete research data and reports. So let's move on to packaging. 
Let's take a look at the overall penetration of the market by various types of packages before the pandemic. So this is in 2019. And what we see here is the, this is the percentage of wine drinkers who drink these various packages on a weekly or monthly basis and those who have never purchased it. Uh, never in this case being the past several years. So it's not a per share of sales it's, uh, or volume, it's a percentage of people who are drinking or not drinking these. And you can see, as you might expect, that the 750 ml bottle is by far the most commonly purchased and the, these other sizes lag. Uh, it's the only per package in this list that's purchased at least monthly. Uh, Whereas these others, compared to, you know, go back to 27, 2018, these are up modestly, you know, several percentage points in terms of the number of people uh, uh, purchasing them. But the trial for these various smaller or uh, alternative packages, 187s, 375s, cans, and Tetra Pak all increased significantly from 4 to 7% during the period 2017 to 2019. Uh, one thing to note, notable about this is that high frequency wine drinkers are three to four times more likely to purchase non-traditional formats, uh, box and Tetra Pak being the ones they index highest for, but it's true for cans, 375s, 187s, uh, similarly. And you might wonder, well, why is that? Uh, it's really because we believe that uh, they have more familiarity and experience with the wines that are available in all these alternate packages. Uh, and alternative packages, whereas traditionally in past times, marginal consumers are more hesitant and worried about making a mistake or picking the wrong wine when they're choosing a wine and tend to stick to what is known and obvious. Now, this may be changing as you're gonna see in the rest of the presentation with younger generations of consumers. So, Let's go back, stay back in the pre-pandemic era, November 2019. We're looking at wine drinkers here, and we asked them, how have you purchased a wine in a can in the past six months? And what you see here are the answers broken down by uh, age and, uh, and gender. And you can see it's 31% uh, of males, 26% of females. Uh, and the number of people who are not interested is a substantial minority. Uh, however, when you look at it by age, you can see right here, it's a steady decline of the trial when it comes to age and a steady increase in lack of interest. So the youngest generation here, iGen, which at this point was 21 to 23 year olds, over half of them say they had actually purchased a can in the last uh, six months and only 14% were not interested in this. Millennials, it's slightly less. Gen X, again, slightly small, slower, lower trial. About a third of them are not interested. And then when you come to the baby boomers, interest in cans just drops off precipitously. Looking over here, added by ethnic breakdown, see white Caucasian, had about a quarter of them had tried, but the uh, percentage trials considerably higher among Black, Hispanic, and Asian American wine consumers. <clears throat> so now I want to caution against assuming this is entirely due to the can as a package, because these populations also index higher in purchasing of wine-based or blended products, such as spritzers or sangria or RTDs generally, and for sparkling wines. So it's not clear that traditional still wine in cans has penetrated these markets more <clears throat> more than white Caucasian, but it is certainly worth looking into. Now, unfortunately, we haven't fielded our benchmark biannual wine market council survey, which those earlier charts were based on in 2021 yet. But I do have some numbers on share and growth by package type uh, from early 2021, courtesy of Wine and Vines Analytics. And what we see here is off-premise sales value share by packaging type broken down by glass, which is the vast majority, uh, then box, which is a significant slice. And then you can see that, you know, this, the packaging that we're, many of us are very excited about is actually still a very small sliver of total uh, value when measured by uh, Nielsen off-premise scan data.
Off-premise sales growth by packaging type is a complete different story. You see enormous growth in cans, both in 2020 and 2021. Uh, in plastic containers, uh, much less growth, but expanding, uh, increasing the rate in uh, 2021. Similar for box. Glass went up in off-premise as well quite a bit, but you have to remember that there was a massive shift in 2021 uh, during the pandemic, early part of the pandemic, with a pantry stocking and uh, and the drop-off in on-premise sales. So it's 20% might be regarded as sort of the, the natural growth rate, so to speak, of uh, container types in wine. And Tetra, on the, on, the, on the other hand, has dropped off quite a bit in terms of its growth rate. The other thing to remember is that for can, plastic, and Tetra, these growth rates are all coming off pretty small bases. Let's take a closer look at consumers now. And this next section is based on data from a large scale study we did in late 2020 uh, on the intersection of occasions and various package types. Uh, and it had two sources of data. One was a survey of Nielsen's household panel. So that's about over 4,000 households were surveyed uh, for this uh, sent the survey for this particular project. But because they were members of Nielsen's household panel, which scans there, which is demographically re represented the US overall, with some exceptions down at the low end of the age bracket and uh, high end of the wealth bracket. Uh, but it's, it's also uh, these home scan members, they actually scan all their purchases from all ver the various channels that they bring home to consume there. So as a, an overall measure of off-premise uh, trends, it's, it's very interesting being multi-source. So first, uh, I'm gonna, before we get to the packaging part, I want to remind everyone's watching this of a couple of things that are uh, distinctive about the modern wine market versus say, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, here we're looking at the wine drinking frequency of the various segments of people in the home scan panel who also respond to the survey. And you can see that we've got our core definition here, people who drink uh, once a week or more often than once a week, it's about 24%. Of the, of the respondents. Here we have marginal wine consumers, which who drink less often than weekly, all the way down to just once every two or three months, but preferring wine over other categories. And then we have what we call the non-adopters who basically don't drink wine or drink it very infrequently. And this group actually breaks down to two really different groups, which is one is people who don't, don't drink beverage alcohol very often at all, no matter what type it is. And the other are people who drink quite a fair amount of beer spirits, uh, but don't drink wine. So just a reminder, there are the names. Now, the point I want to make with this is that you've got a tremendous amount of crossover now, people drinking multiple categories. That's the norm. For example, two thirds of core wine drinkers also drink spirits and a over a third of them drink spirits on a weekly basis. Among marginals, over half of them drink beer and one quarter of them drink beer on a weekly basis. Uh, and similarly, among the non-adopters, you know, you've got this group who don't drink it alcohol much, very often at all, but you still have one fifth drinking spirits on a weekly basis and one quarter drinking beer on a weekly basis. So everyone is exposed to a much wider variety of drinks and a wider variety of packages than they were in the past. So there's a lot more chance to sort of compare and have tr try out and see how different packages fit into your lifestyle. Now, First thing I should do to preface this chart is, by, is to tell you that core and marginal wine consumers continue to diverge in consumption and attitudes. More core wine consumers say they are increasing rather than decreasing consumption of wine. And many of them are increasing other drinks or categories, hard seltzer or spirits or whatever it may be, to the point where wine's share of their purchases is actually slightly down, even if they're drinking or purchasing a bit more wine. In converse, among marginals, substantially more of them are decreasing wine drinking than increasing. And a large minority of them are decreasing alcohol consumption across the board. Their share going to RTDs and spirits is up. 
So we did ask those who were reducing wine consumption, whether marginal or core wine consumers, why? And these are the reasons they gave us. Uh, almost half of them said it was for the same reason they were reducing alcohol consumption in general. A quarter of them said there were just fewer occasions on which they drink wine or those kind of occasions came along much less often. That's clearly related to the pandemic. So that's could be, you know, it's kind of a social condition that could be relatively temporary. And what you see here is, you know, they prefer the other taste. This is mostly a marginal thing, preferring the taste of other types of alcohol or it doesn't fit in their current diet. Diet here means just the way they eat, not diet as in like I'm on a particular regime. Again, a social thing, friends, family typically don't drink wine. And only way down here, you see 7% said that, uh, oh, it's because wine is not, you know, other drinks are more conveniently packaged than wine. They're smaller or they don't need a corkscrew or whatever the case may be. So you can see that packaging does not appear to be a major reason for drinking less wine. However, marginal wine consumers are five times more likely to cite packaging as an issue than core wine consumers. So, and these consumers are a large portion of younger wine consumers, and they're also traditionally a base for the gradual adoption of wines and some of them evolving into core wine consumers. That was a major driver during 2000 to 2010 of the growth in wine sales. So it is some concern for sure. And it also suggests that more convenient packaging might have a role to play there in the future. Now let's look at what the, uh, the home scan panel told us about a uh, share of uh, the purchases based on their actual purchasing data here, not just what they responded in the survey. And what we did here was in this row covers core wine consumers. This is marginal wine consumers, i.e. people who drink wine less often than once a week. And we divide into winners in terms of gaining share of volume versus losers. And I'm not gonna go over all the details here, but what's quite intriguing from the packaging point of view is that things in small packages, convenient packages, be they cans or small bottles, et cetera, showed pretty st strong growth in taking of share during the uh, course of 2020 versus 2019. So hard seltzer among, even among core wine drinkers was had an increase of 1.5% in share, uh, and total RTDs lagged that only slightly, and that's including, you know, pre-mixed cocktails or sangria or spritzers or whatever the case may be. Similarly, among marginal wine drinkers, hard seltzer gained even more, as did total RTDs. And the one of the only wine, uh, the only two types of wine uh, that gained significant share among marginal wine drinkers were wines in small packages under 500 ml and all other wine, which, which includes a lot of things that are in RTD style packaging, you know, sort of fruit flavored wines or, or other mixed beverages. So you can see there that, you know, the, these convenient packages with the newer products certainly picked up share uh, in terms of consumers wine consumers' purchases during 2020. Okay, so let's go to another study we did. One of the theories about wine and cans popularity is that it makes wine much more attractive for certain types of occasions where wine was not previously considered a good or likely choice, for example, outdoor barbecues or casual parties. At the Wine Market Council, we tested that assumption, among others, with a study during late uh, 2020 um, when researching, sorry, the, during late 2019 and early 2020, and uh, we researched cans, other small packages, in some cases comparing them to wines in the bottle, and we gave people these choice experiments over different occasions, which I'll explain shortly. Uh, it's not really, a, uh, well, actually, I should explain, explain this, the, uh, how we, it worked. What we did was, among other things, uh, is expose people to imaginary situations where we said, okay, you know, imagine you're going to movie night and there are these types of beverages are at your friend's house uh, with a bunch of other friends and you're going to pick one of them to drink that evening. Which one would you pick? And they were shown, in addition to the list of things they could pick, they were shown pictures, kind of like what you see back here. 
of the various choices where you might see a wine bottle with a glass and then a bottle of beer next to it and then a bottle of cider and then a can of uh, hard seltzer and then a pre-mixed cocktail, RTD style. And uh, the actual brands and identity were all blurred out. So you couldn't read them. It was just reading by the type of uh, bottle container and the type of product. And what we did was randomly assign people to see either wine in a bottle with a glass next to it or a can of wine. So they saw one of those two images uh, on a random basis. And then we compared the results between them. Now, we, we specifically said in all of these occasions that the wine or beer or products were already there on offer. So it's not really a test of portability, which is another strong attribute for cans. Since the scenarios assumed the respondent was offered a choice at the venue, they didn't have to buy it or bring from home the product. And this was because we wanted the experiment to reflect the personal preferences of the chooser at the time without being influenced by pricing or cost or, or hassle bringing from home or anything like that. So let's look at the results. This one is, uh, was imagine, the actual question was, imagine that you're a friend's house for movie night with a group of friends and are offered the following beverages. With this type of occasion in mind, which of the beverages shown would most likely be your first choice? And what we see here, I'm going to show you the measures for uh, wine, for uh, RTD, various types of RTD products, uh, for beer, conventional beer, and for wine when it was shown in a can. And we're going to compare these results for iGen, millennials, Generation X, boomers, and those age 74 plus. And what we have here we're measuring is the percentage of people who made that their first choice of a beverage that evening. So what we see here is wine, when it was shown in a bottle, had was around 40% of the respondents pretty flat all the way up to generation X. And then it, as a first choice, it expanded rapidly among boomers and those older than boomers. Wine, when it was shown in a can, however, did not increase in uh, attractiveness. In fact, went up slightly among boomers uh, and then down uh, among people who are older. But here, you know, right around once you get to the boomers is where the difference between wine shown in the bottle and wine shown in the can uh, really emerges. It was much more likely to be chosen as a choice of beverage if it was shown in a bottle with a glass than it was when it was just shown in the can. Uh, in contrast, this is what we see for, for conventional beer. It starts off rather low among iGen, then runs pretty flat and even with wine all the way up through boomers and then trails off in the uh, flat with the 74 plus. And the RTDs start out even stronger than wine for this occasion among people who are younger, dropping to a little lower than wine for millennials, uh, flat for Generation X, and then trailing off to very low numbers, choosing it once you get to boomers and older. Now let's look at the same uh, chart for the outdoors occasion. And so what we said there was, imagine that you've met friends or family at an outdoor venue, such as a park or the beach or a picnic or barbecue or casual get together and are offered the following beverages. And it was the same selection in the same situation. You were randomly shown wine in a can versus or wine in a bottle and all the other products alternatives remain the same. And here we see quite a different set of numbers Wine, again, is in the maroon, wine in the bottle, and uh, pink for the wine in the can. First of all, wine does a lot worse in the outdoors occasion than it does on movie night. It stays relatively low when seen in the bottle, whether you're, uh, in, you know, whether you're 20 something or whether you're 75, uh, it doesn't raise your rise up very much. On the other hand, Wine in the when shown the can is seen as equally attractive a choice among uh, iGen and millennials, but then trails off behind wine in the bottle and remains below as a relatively small percentage as you get older. Contrast beer for outdoors just soars and utterly dominates among boomers and those who are older, although it's only like somewhat more uh, attractive than wine for the youngest consumers. In contrast, RTDs dominate for the youngest consumers 
are still about highest or even with beer for millennials and then drop off precipitously in attractiveness. So you can see there's really dramatic differences in package related preferences uh, and types of uh, product between the generations. And also that the reaction to choosing wine in terms of percentage choosing wine uh, varies quite a bit between can and bottles, but that variation and the magnitude of the difference uh, varies quite a bit by occasion as well. And we asked them, well, what was the reason for your first choice? And this was their main reason for all beverage types. Who, uh, who, and then in parentheses, you can see what the percentage was for those who picked wine. And by far, most people just said, I go with what I like the taste of best. Uh, and this dominated for movie night. It was over the majority of people. And indeed, it was even higher for wine. In outdoors, however, it was only about a third of the people picked just based on taste in overall. But interestingly enough, taste was quite dominant for wine drinkers. So in this, my interpretation of this is that in this case, wine drinker, core wine drinkers' preference for wine drove them to pick wine, even though it isn't typically cued in the outdoor occasion. Uh, and basically all the other all the other reasons, including doesn't require a glass, uh, were quite low except for fitting the occasion. Movie night, 20%, almost, almost one fifth said, 19%, almost one fifth said that, you know, it doesn't fit the occasion, it fits this occasion better. That's why I chose whatever they chose, beer, wine, or whatever. Uh, and outdoors occasion fitting is much more important. Almost a third of the people said that in general, and but that dropped off for wine because wine is not seen by a number of people as really fitting the outdoor occasion. And the interesting thing is, doesn't require glass was significantly higher outdoors than it was indoor, uh, indoors at movie night, as you might expect, but it wasn't actually that important a factor. So despite the, uh, sorry, uh, so taste was also the leading reason for not picking wine on either occasion. About one in 10. So you can see that, you know, we, we also asked people, why didn't you pick wine if they didn't pick wine? And uh, taste was still the dominant reason. About one in 10 of the, those people who stated cited taste also disliked wine in a can on movie night and about one in six in outdoors. So you've got a minority, but but still significant of people who are using can as a cue for quality. I would say though, that that's less than I would have expected. Uh, cans do seem to reduce the demand for wine in various occasions when it's, the bottle is not shown as the option when it's just a can. Uh, but in terms of perception of its flavor or taste, that's still a minority of the people who are doing it. It's still really occasion driven. Um, and category package driven rather than uh, perception of taste. Doesn't fit the occasion was the second reason for not picking wine outdoors, and but it wasn't really significantly different whether the wine is in a bottle or a can. So it seems like can's ability to change wine's perception uh, as an, being appropriate for an occasion just by being a can is actually not that strong. Here we look at the breakdown of wine shown the bottle versus wine shown the can. And you can see that indeed there was a uh, significant drop off on movie night when wine was shown in the can in terms of the percentage of people, wine drinkers who would choose it as their first choice. In the outdoor event, the percentage of wine drinkers, even though wine is their favorite alcoholic beverage is much lower than at movie night. But there, a modest drop off was seen for wine in the can too. So it does have some impact on perceived uh, attractiveness, uh, but it's not an overwhelming impact by any chance. It doesn't really determine it completely. 16% of those who ruled out wine outdoors said, I definitely wouldn't pick it, did so because it needs a glass, but few cited that on movie night. And when we rummaged through the open end comments that accompanied this, uh, this particular study, it really became clear that uh, a lot of people assume they're going to pour wine in a can into a glass. Uh, it's not just drunk out of the can by most people, quite the contrary. Uh, many of the people who cited that, oh, I would, I, I doesn't need a glass for wine in the can, obviously we're assuming that 
you know, if you're supposed to drink it out with a glass. And a lot of the other people who cited they would pick it said that, oh, it was convenient because it didn't need a corkscrew, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of people are assuming they're going to pour their wine into a glass. And therefore, wine purchased by the can does not automatically imply you're dispensing with the glassware uh, for good or ill. The percentage of younger consumers choosing wine in a can for each occasion was offset by older consumers defecting from wine. So what you have here is that even though a number of, of uh, the number of younger consumers who stayed with wine or even added wine to the increased wine's attractiveness in their selection in cell B who were exposed to wine in the can, uh, and similarly here, in both cases, they were offset by older consumers who defected from wine to beer or uh, hard seltzer RTDs when they saw wine in a can compared to when they saw wine in a bottle. Uh, in that same study, we also pr probed consumers' perceptions of various types of packages on a couple of dimensions. So what we did was we presented consumers with images of the packages that we were asking them about with the brand and type identity blurred out. So it was just based on the package shape, color, et cetera. Uh, in one section, we asked people to assess several smaller format wine packages, you know, including 500 ml uh, Tetra Pak, 375 ml uh, bottle, and 187 ml bottle. And we asked them, you know, what their experience level was with it. And 42% had purchased in the past year this uh, 187. Uh, over half said they had purchased wine in the 375 at some point, and then uh, only a quarter said they had purchased, uh, um, sorry, this is not just in the past year, this is ever, had purchased a Tetra Pak. However, significant numbers bordering on around a third across all the categories were interested in doing such a purchase, whereas only a fifth of people said they would never buy 187s, only one in 10 375s, and only 30% uh, for the, uh, the Tetra Pak. Coors had higher purchase rates for than marginal wine drinkers for half bottles and Tetra Packs and similar for 187s. Uh, the Coors were more interested than disinterested in all packages if they hadn't actually tried them. Uh, marginals were more interested in the two bottles, but split pretty evenly between interest and disinterest in the Tetra Pack. The people who purchased these single serve bottles skewed younger as you might expect. Uh, and the same with the people who had purchased Tetra Packs. Uh, in another exercise, we present people with wine in a can or an aluminum container in various shapes and sizes. And again, the identity of the wines were blurred out, but of course you could get some notion of the graphics uh, from you know, behind the blur uh, on each of those. And that appeared to have an effect too. And respondents were asked to indicate their interest in the various sizes, uh, but also you know, how much they thought was actually in these, uh, these various cans. So we asked people to estimate the number of wine servings and whatever their usual serving size was for, for each one of those cans. And here's what they said. You have huge range in these various cans as portrayed in the estimate of serving. So 31%, as you guess, guess the smallest can had less than one serving. Uh, very few people guessed that either of these cans or these two had less than one serving. On the other hand, you have large numbers of people up here, the majority saying this had two or three servings versus a somewhat similar shape can where you have about 40% saying two plus servings. And you can see by the sort of shaded areas here, approximately where most people thought uh, the number of servings fell for each one of those can sizes. The actual size by volume, well, this was a 250, this was a 375, this was a 500 ml, this was a 187, this is also 250, and this is also 375. Very interesting to see the two 250 sizes quite different in their perception of the number of servings, skewing low for the thin can versus sort of middle to higher for the bottle shape, the aluminum shape, bottle shape. Similarly with the 375s, 
you have a somewhat lower range for the squat sort of traditional beer shape 375 and skewing somewhat higher an estimate of servings for the taller, thinner version. The number of actual standard servings we put down here based on the standard five ounce wine pour, 150 ml. This was the mean number of estimated servings by the respondents who saw these various things. So what you can see is first of all, uniformly, they underestimate the number of servings in each one of these packages. And that underestimation is really considerable in the 500 ml. So you can look at that two ways. Either people are going to be drinking too much too fast from 500 mLs, or it's going to be seen as a higher value package. Depends on how the person actually uses it. People were pretty close to the actual servings uh, size when it came to this intriguing bottle, which, by the way, was also the most popular of the shapes in terms of purchase interest. Uh, with a mean rating of 5.1 on a seven point scale, and only 16% of it rated it negatively. Uh, the large 500 ml can did the, had the lowest purchase interest, but it was extremely varied across the whole spectrum from one to seven points being low and low to high. Uh, and I suspect the reception to the color sort of vaguely blurred graphics was probably a factor here. So some last thoughts. Um, several factors influence the appeal of alternate packaging. They're sometimes complementary. They're sometimes in conflict. So they work both ways against each other in some, uh, I think, in some uh, wines and uh, complementary in others, depending on who your target market is. Obviously, the newer, smaller packages have a very strong skew towards younger consumers who seem to be both more interested in small packages, whether for trial or, or uh, portability, whatever the case may be, and are more open to non-traditional packaging. Uh, the large box formats appeal to high volume occasions like big parties or high frequency consumers. They actually have a pretty narrow base in terms of the number of people who buy them with any regularity and it's strongly skewed towards core wine consumers. Smaller packages allow lower cost of trial. So if for getting people involved in wine or more interested in wine or more interested in new varieties or types of wine or brands, they, they actually have quite a bit of appeal on that uh, vector. And then finally, the higher frequency and higher knowledge wine consumers in tr traditionally are more likely to try alternative packaging because they just have more confidence in their purchasing uh, uh, decisions in general. But recent purchase data and age demographics suggest that small containers do have a role to play in attracting marginal wine consumers among the uh, younger generations. The thing is, cans are just not a panacea for various wines, wines competitive issues when it comes to occasion and flavor. You know, the, the, it's very, their various attributes are all helpful. But one thing we found out is that they don't significantly or dramatically change wine's appeal in new or different occasions or for open up you know, a whole bunch of brand new wine consumers. Uh, we don't know, however, if there's a long-term, maybe there's a long-term kind of beneficial democratizing of wine when it's around in smaller, more accessible and more easily purchased packaging. That remains to be seen. The other thing to keep in mind is studies and data on current alternative packaging, they don't include the impact of some upscale, widely known or purchased brands being offered in such formats. It's a little bit like the early days of screw cap wines when you asked, well, are screw caps downscale? And people would say yes, uh, because those are the only kind of wines they saw them in. Uh, then you, you, know, you had the New Zealanders uh, and the popularity of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and a lot of wines being sold at 14 $15, $18 a bottle with screw caps, and that sort of uh, put that to rest to some extent. So, you know, the question remains, what is going to happen to people's perception of cans if they start seeing, you know, Mayomi or Rex Hill or The Prisoner or something like that in a can? And then the other thing we have to consider is the merchandising impact of wine in newer, smaller packages. Cans may be getting wine into locations where it wasn't previously visible or an option. So it's not so much the consumer occasion, but the merchandising occasion that may offer some real benefits here. You know, being getting into more sports or concert venues, getting better cold box space. There are stores where canned wine is actually 
uh, mingling on the shelves in terms of section. It's no longer in the wine section. It's in a sort of hybrid section with, you know, spritzers, seltzer, RTDs, whatever, all being mixed together. So that pretty much concludes my sort of hodgepodge of ideas and insights from, on our, from our consumer research on the various types of new and alternative packages. Uh, I would say one thing as a last uh, plea, please, if you're coming out with brand new or substantially revising your packaging, test it. Color, wording, graphic, shape, these all have significant and often hard to predict impact. And it's often not very expensive uh, to test. And for if you're selling a lot of your wine on pre off premise, it's your most important communications tool or investment. So do the test quantitatively, do it on your target consumers. Uh, and if you're, you know, wondering how to do it, you're free to feel free to contact me and I'll uh, send you in the right direction, I hope. Uh, in any case, for more info on this particular research, you can go to the Wine Market Council's website, and uh, we do release some of the top lines and the newsletter and other things that you can find. And who knows, you know, if you want to probe deeper into this research, you may want to join the Wine Market Council. With that, I'm going to wrap it up, and we'll move on to the uh, next speaker. Thank you all for listening. Well, thank you, Christian. That was fantastic. Now to pile on, we've got Mike Provence, the CEO of 3 by 3 Insights. Mike is going to really dive into the numbers a little bit and, and look at how these alternative packages are actually performing in the marketplace. Mike, go ahead and take it away. Hi, I'm Mike Provence, CEO at 3 by 3 We're an independent liquor store insights and marketing company that focuses on helping the spirits business build better futures. I'm going to be in the uh, live chat during this presentation, so feel free to leave questions for me as you're listening along. And I look forward to telling you a little bit of what I've seen as I looked at our data about packaging in the independent liquor channel. First things first, let me give you a sense of where the, the data you're going to see come from. We analyzed 280 stores across 20 states over the period of 2019 through the middle of 2021. That represents about 81 million transactions and $1.4 billion in sales over that period. This gave us a very good view of the kinds of patterns and interesting insights that we've been seeing as we looked at the kinds of products people are buying in the independent liquor channel. And I think it's important to note as we get through this conversation that we are very much focused on this one channel because the behaviors of shoppers when they shop in grocery or big box like Costco and Walmart tend to be very different. And in fact, I would imagine as we go through this, we'll see areas where shopping behaviors here are very different in terms of packaging than what you see when someone buys wine or other spirits at the grocery store. So let's dive in. Just to give you highlights of what I think we're going to talk about and see through the uh, rest of this conversation, packaging in the independent channel really looks like experiments. And I say that because you're going to see that from an overall sales perspective, it doesn't make an enormous impact on the, on the channel, but it does introduce novelty and it introduces consumers to the notion of choice and different opportunities for purchase. And so it creates a perception in the market that wine or beer or spirits are going through a phase of innovation and change. And as we all know, when it comes to marketing, perception is reality. And so that's why we feel the, the power of packaging in the alcohol industry. The other thing we'll see is that package-oriented purchase choices tend to be driven by conditions and occasions. And in some, some ways, this is not, uh, not, diff not unusual or not a original kind of insight, but I think you'll find some interest in the details as we dig into that. And finally, you know, boxed wine was probably one of the early leaders in changing the way we think about packaging. But one of the things we started to see in this industry uh, is that in the spirit side, we're seeing a big surge, uh, whether it's ready to drink or other kinds of spirits products that are now bringing other new packaging to the industry. And that 
is creating a lot of cross-pollination between categories. So let's dive into the data now. As I mentioned before, this is really more about perception than reality when we talk about your local liquor store. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. When you're talking about stores that are ranging from a million and a half, $2 million in sales up to maybe 10, 15, 20 million, the biggest difference they have over every other channel is the number of SKUs they carry. And whether that's just spirits and wine, as it might be in New York, or it's all three categories in other states, you still see a wide range in the number of SKUs that are presented. And especially in the case of the wine category, you can be in stores that might in any given year have 2,000 to 5,000 SKUs that they're managing and putting on the shelves. Most of those SKUs come in traditional packaging. So when you look at the actual sales data, the trade out data from this independent store channel, more than 95% of that of the sales come from the traditional bottle, right? Secondly, you see it coming from box products, mostly boxed wines. And then you see in these charts, a very small sliver in 2019 and 2020 that's made up of the other packaging uh, opportunities for purchase in the stores, whether those are Tetra packs or cans or um, Really, really anything, pouches and bags, or are, are you'll, you'll also see are, are have a little bit of traction in the market. And the only big difference between 2019 and 2020, ironically, in the mix of packaging, was a very, very small shift, 30 basis points of movement between box and bottle. So box picked up a tiny bit of ground. When you dig into it, though, the experiments actually are interesting. And what you're seeing here in this chart is an indexing of sales as they compare to Q1 of 2019, meaning compared to January to February of 2019. So we set 2019 as indexed at zero. Really, for those of you that uh, want to look at the math of it, it's set to one. But to be able to show the, the ups and downs, I obviously normalized it to zero. What you uncover here are big surges in sales, relatively speaking to, Jan to that first quarter of 2019, in pouch and bag. And now we're looking here at all three categories. So most of that growth is what you're seeing is the growth in RTDs and other spirits-based products. And in some cases, wine-based products that are being marketed as seltzers or as uh, drinks that come in you know, more portable type of packaging and more, in fact, uh, smaller packaging geared toward individuals. You also see shifts in um, growth in cans and in boxes in the 2019 to 2020 period. And I think we all know you know the underlying driver in many regards, there was a shift to more portable packaging during COVID as people sought outdoor activities and ways to get out of the house or and or be able to have more engagements, more backyard barbecues and parties with their uh, small groups of friends, their pods during that period of time. You also see in 2021, a decrease in sales over relative to 2019. And the driver there is a driver that we're all familiar with as well anecdotally that the liquor store channel, because it saw a burst in sales in that COVID period, as restaurants and bars came back online, started to see a small decline in sales. And so you see anywhere in the neighborhood of five to 10% decline, depending on the stores, uh, in overall sales. And wine in particular took a stronger hit in that uh, due to the fact that in many cases, people were going back to the restaurants and bars to uh, to have dinner and to drink wine with dinner. So there, there is this, as I mentioned before, the, the behaviors tend to be based around occasions and conditions, right? So the conditions here are in a pre, during, and post COVID. Um, but the occasions are also the occasions that drive people to be in places where having unique packaging, having very packable, very portable type of packaging 
uh, is important. So whether that's the pool, the backyard, the beach, on a boat, all of those kinds of occasions and conditions are driving experiments and packaging. Now, one thing I'll say is, as you probably have heard throughout the, the, the sessions, in other channels, it's very likely that what is an experiment in the independent sector is a much bigger share of mind and wallet and market uh, in other channels because of that issue around SKUs that I mentioned. Right? Often in grocery or other channels, you don't see nearly the number of SKUs being carried and therefore you have more prominence of these new kinds of packaging and these products that are, are coming in new formats. You also see more prominent display of those going back to my comments about, about perception being reality. So, you know, on the downside and talking about packaging with the local liquor store, we're only dealing with about 5% of overall sales. But let's dive into the overall, that 5% and see if there's anything interesting in there to, uh, to look at. So I, I mentioned before the Tetra Pak. So one, one of the unique anomalies in, in data is if you start from a very small base, you can show very rapid growth. But one of the, the neat things I've pulled from the data as I was looking through it to put this presentation together is that Tetra Packs shot up like wildfire over this last two and a half year period. Now they did that from an extremely small base. And so they are truly what I would call an innovation experiment. Uh, and they may or may not take hold, but as you can see, they jumped from you know, practically zero to um, almost a four order of magnitude growth in the size of sales volume. When you look at the chart on the right, when we remove Tetris from it, we can actually see who's giving up ground to these new forms of innovation. The blue section on the bottom represents the traditional bottle product sales. And they, throughout the two and a half year period, stay very stable. And in fact, they finish off that period roughly where they start in terms of share of all sales of wine in our sample. The box side of this follows a very similar pattern. If you were to trace basically the gap in between the orange and the blue lines here, you would see very little variance. And in fact, again, by beginning to end, you end up with about the same share of sales in the, in the sample. By contrast, in that gray space, which is cans, you do see a decline from its peak back in Q2 and uh, Q3 of 2019 to Q2 of 2021. You know, roughly about a 10 point to 12 point downward shift in its share of sales. That would suggest that when all these experiments are happening over the last two and a half years, they've been taking share from other experiments rather than encroaching on a very strong position of the, let's call it the top two package types in wine being bottle and box. If we dig a little bit deeper and you remove that outlier of the Tetras altogether, you begin to see an even more interesting story because you also begin to see how canned wine sales are slowing. Remember that over this period, from 2020 to 2021, liquor stores showed an overall decline. What, that, what these data suggest is that that overall decline is coming from the canned wine slowing down, not being fully replaced by the new innovation, new innovations in packaging, and some slowdown in both bottle and box. Uh, although, as you look in that period leading up to 2021, you know, canned wines were where the surge was, and that was generally tied to that spring and summertime period. Again, the kind of occasions and conditions at work. But we're expecting that we won't see that kind of surge with canned wines as we look ahead into the rest of 2021, simply because the entire category is down and because the level of downness, if you will, of the canned wine uh, is slightly more significant than either um, the bottle or the box 
um, with with any luck, as you look at the Q2 2021, we'll see a little bit of recovery in the can space as well. But let's dig in for a moment to these two categories of box and canned wines and look at what we're seeing in the data there. Within box wines, if we look across some of the most popular uh, varietals that make up the box wine trend, uh, we see both reflected here, different patterns of behavior in that the Cabernet Sauvignons were early leaders in this and have made a little bit of a resurgence back and continue to be the kind of highest grossing sales. And what you're seeing here in terms of the numbers is a reflection of total nine liter case equivalents sold across our sample. So it's you know not a huge difference from some of the other leaders like Chardonnay or Pinot Grigio, but where in the winter time, Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay were dipping as would be expected, you see a surge in Cabernet Sauvignon box sales and vice versa. In the summertime, you see a drop in Cab and you see a slight rise in Chardonnay and Pinot Grigio. Again, to be totally expected because we're talking about seasonal variations and in drinking habits. Uh, at the same time, as you look at some of the ones that aren't seeing quite the same share of sales in the store, you see some similar dynamics, but you also see an overall decline in these boxed wines as we go from Q1 2021 to Q1 22. Again, I think, you know, anecdotally and with some broader look at the data in these liquor stores, this is a reflection or a correlation with decreases they're seeing across the board. And some of the challenges they're seeing in a post-COVID world of recovering their business as it shifts back to on-premise. It will be interesting as we head to the second half of this year to see the degree to which you know the the off-premise industry and the liquor channel, independent liquor channel in particular, is able to recover some of those losses with again some of the uncertainty in the in the environment. The chart on the right gives us a, a somewhat different look, and it's a look at how, again, sales changed relative to 2020 uh, to 2019 in Q1 2019. So this is a reflection of great increases in both Cab and Chardonnay from the 2019 position. But as you look um, down the chart further, you start to see that those bottom uh, varietals in the chart take steep declines in, uh, in sales relative to their 2019 position. That is a reflection that some of these more narrow var varietals are not holding up as well in the market as you know, the steadfast Cab and Chardonnay box wines are holding up. Uh, that's obviously good for you know, those, those leaders, um, but people are starting to settle into you know, the products and the brands that are the perhaps most widely distributed and, and most um, prominent in their, in their mind. On the canned wine side, uh, again, looking at a similar chart where we're comparing an index against Q1 of 2019, uh, and this is using volume rather than dollar sales in doing this indexing, uh, Rosé and Chardonnay uh, were the strongest. And obviously the strongest in summer periods, as you see here in 2019 and 2020. Um, what's particularly interesting is the kind of steady decline that we see coming from sparkling and Pinot Grigio over the course of the last four quarters, uh, suggesting again in, in the slowing growth of Rosé and Chardonnay, suggesting that as a packaging uh, format overall, canned wine is starting to give up some ground to some of these other um, more novel and uh, uh, and some of the more traditional formats for uh, shipping wine. So if I can kind of wrap up this conversation, um, I think the biggest point to take here is that, you know, and this is a point that is important to note just generally when you think about the independent liquor channel, the behaviors of shoppers in this channel is very different from this, the behaviors you see when you look at other channels like big box or clubs or, um, or grocery. And in particular, 
and mainly because of the nature of the businesses and the number of SKUs that are carried, which can be two, three, four times in the liquor store what's carried in a grocery store. Non-traditional packaging doesn't get the prominence and doesn't create the level of perception in terms of opportunity for purchase or novelty for purchase that it can create in other channels. Um, so it doesn't have that big impact on store sales. That's not to say it's not important. Um, it can act in many ways the same way that beer does in the local liquor store, which is it's needed to be there because that's why people come in. But ultimately, they're there and shopping for a number of different products. So where beer might be a loss leader in a store, you can think of these different packaging alternatives in wine and more broadly across spirits as um, innovation leaders in the store. They bring people in, people are looking for it. They've seen the ads, they've gotten the word of mouth, they want to buy it, it needs to be there, but it doesn't carry a huge presence. It's not going to have a number of facings that make it a more powerful product yet. But I believe as that traction begins to take hold, this is a growth area for the liquor stores. We do see, as we saw through some of the data here, that in boxed and canned wines, there's still solid position in the market with both canned wines giving up a little growth. But more importantly, it's the shopper sentiment that's shifting. It's the varietals and the product choices that are shifting within these particular formats. So it's less about the format and it's more about the story being told about the products that are in those formats. Um, looking ahead, you know, my thought would be we'll see better growth from canned wine simply because there's more room for recovery. The bottle and box wines are, like we saw, pretty solid in the market. Uh, obviously, within each of these formats, you see a lot of shifting in terms of specific brands or specific um, specific choices. But from a format point of view, we should see, hopefully see, canned wines being able to recover and grow into the summer and uh, and continue to kind of establish itself. On the experimental and the, let's call it the kind of innovation formats that we're seeing, we know that's going to continue. I think for in many cases, you see experiments in packaging simply because some of these varietals and some of these categories are so crowded that the only way to be an innovative brand in the space is to come at it from a different angle. And that different angle is often thinking about the use case of how, how that shopper is drinking your product, where they're doing that, and using packaging as a differentiator as part of that story. And so I would expect to see the experiments continue. I would expect to see some winners come from that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Tetras, because like I said, very, very wildfire-like growth from a very, very small base. Um, but the indicators are there that there may be something to that if enough brands can kind of glom onto the format and give it a try. Um, so that's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed and learned something from this. I think in the independent liquor store, the, the story of packaging is a uh, is a more limited one from pure numbers, but from a perception and from a position in the market, I think it's a very important uh, topic that, that liquor store owners, that brands and, and retailers need to be uh, considering as they build out their product portfolios in, the, in this channel. Thank you very much. 